our last episode, we introduced the concept that said that when it comes to Paul's prohibition that says, I do not permit a woman to teach nor have authority over a man, that this is actually connected to what I would see as the greater canonical context that we need to look throughout the New Testament and ask the question, what do we observe? What do we not observe? And particularly, I argued um, briefly, uh, by the way of introduction, that my particular view is what we would call a nuanced complementarian view. And that would be to kind of unpack that particular phrase. That would be this, that there are distinctives in the the genders when it comes to responsibilities, but not when it comes to equality. Specifically in the household, and recognize again, when it comes to household, I mean about the individual home, a marriage, um, but also in the greater home, uh, which is the community of the church, that there are universal uh, principles of distinctives when it comes to gender and the roles that they have. So in the home, a husband, and in the greater home, the elders and overseers. Now, specifically, I'm speaking about elders and overseers or elders overseers as one role as kind of a parallel to the the fatherly role of the household. And I would actually argue that it is not all men who are given authority in the greater church, but it's those men who take on that responsibility, not power, but that responsibility of that role in this household. Um, The other dynamic that's interesting about that as we dive into a little bit later, chapter three, is when it comes to this particular paradigm is that, again, we are all equal uh, at the foot of the cross when it comes to being heirs of Christ and disciples of Christ, and yet we are given unique and different roles. Notice the phrase given. I want to say that because no one deserves any role in the household of God. It is all a grace. Um, it is all it is all a God's gift to us to have a role to play in his household. And so no matter the role, obviously we have other metaphors that are used uh, as well of body metaphor or temple metaphor when it comes to architecture. And we are all given a, a role. And sometimes those roles are unique and complementary uh, to one another. So that particular view is there. I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into this text um, because when it comes to verse 13, it seems to be at least at first blush, and and others would disagree, that Paul is arguing from creation that this uh, hierarchy, if you will, is a part of a universal principle. Notice what Paul says in verse 13. He uses the word for, which seems to be at first, from the way Paul uses this language, an, an argument based upon, in this case, the creation account. For Adam was formed first and then Eve. Now, at first blush, we go, well, that's kind of a weird argument just because Adam was made first. But what is happening here is possibly um, possibly the idea of the firstborn being given in a household additional responsibilities. And in this particular moment, the firstborn being Adam, being given this accountability to not only teach what was right, but also held accountable when that which was taught wrong is not upheld. So verse 14 says, and Adam was not deceived, but it was the woman who was deceived and became the transgressor. I think by insinuation, what Paul is arguing is that, but Adam was actually held accountable for that because he was the one responsible. Now, there's other ways of coming out this particular text, because to be quite honest, it's rather difficult. One of the questions we have is, is Paul actually dealing with something else going on in the background? For instance, was the church in Ephesus specifically dealing with false teaching going along with maybe the cult of Artemis? Artemis, by the way, um, but obviously being a goddess, had female priestesses. Um, are those female priestesses then coming into the church wanting to be teachers of um, the, the gospel and wanting to have this position of authority in the church? And are they, even in the sense of when it comes to the creation myth, kind of bringing in some of the myth of Artemis, Artemis being born before her brother, twin brother, by the way. And in fact, in the myth, she's born and immediately helps her mom give birth to her brother. Are they bringing this myth into their context and trying to propagate some of those teachings in the life of the church? Well, that's all a possibility. Let me just suggest to you that at at the very most, um, it's something that's speculatory. We, We actually look at the cult of Artemis and dive a little bit deeper. Here's one of the things that we discover, at least as far as the evidence that I've examined. 
When it comes to the role of a priest or priestess in a pagan cult, they didn't have a teaching role, a vocal role. Their role was more of like what we actually see in the term deacon or servant. They helped serve in the temple and carry out the sacrifices, and they were representatives. They dressed the part, and even in parades, the priestesses dressed the part of Artemis. They actually wore the pearls and gold and and did their hair and, and looked the part of the goddess, but they didn't really have this authoritative teacher role. So it seems a little bit abstract to say that this is a one-to-one, they're coming into the church and they're doing this. Maybe there's another possibility. Uh, Maybe the possibility is there's kind of this um, movement in the Roman world coming out of Rome itself and really infiltrating kind of the the outer regions, the the Greek culture, the Greek-influenced culture uh, of Ephesus and the surrounding region. And maybe what's happening here is this, this movement away from traditional values is impacting Ephesus. And in fact, I think that's a, quite a possibility. But if Paul's corrective is for the more, we would even say traditional, according to Roman values, traditional roles of household uh, roles when it comes to a father, or in this case, an overseer, um, maybe, maybe we should ask the question, is that Paul just dealing with this circumstance in the ancient world? Well, maybe that's true. But if we have some of the same dynamics in our context, in our culture, would Paul not then also say the same thing? You see how difficult this becomes? It reminds me a little bit of like when my kids put away the Christmas lights and we get them out of the attic, we start to unwrap them and we start to pull on those lights. And every time you try to pull on a knot, it pulls on another knot. Can can I give you another uh, question mark? When it comes to the role of overseer and elder, is that at times equal to uh, the role of the preaching minister? Or we sometimes use the phrase pastor in some of our movements. Is that role equal to the role of preacher? And I'm going to use the word elder or overseer interchangeably. We'll talk about that in our next section. And I think oftentimes the preacher in the kind of American West, uh, as well as other contexts, oftentimes does function as the, if not a, primary teaching authority in the life of the church, teaching the core doctrine as a healthy foundation. So all of these things become rather intertwined when it comes to uh, this particular conversation. Uh, if Adam, if the conversation about Adam and Eve is actually talking about Adam being given this responsibility, then it makes sense in context that Paul's next going to talk about those in the life of this household who are given the responsibility of a healthy doctrine, even when, when it comes to false teachers, like in the context of Adam and Eve, that doctrine is being threatened. Now, notice what we have here is Paul then in verse 15 comes back and in the story of Adam and Eve actually comes back and adds value to Eve in the story. Because what we discover is this, is we, we discover salvation through the Adam and Eve story. Yet she will be saved through, and I want to add the little word, the, in front of childbearing. In fact, when it comes to Eve, Notice that the she singular language that is there, she will be saved through the childbearing that was to come. If they, now notice the the they language, Eve actually becomes then somewhat symbolic or a type of all women if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Now, there's a couple options with this verse 15. Are women saved by bearing children? No, that doesn't seem to be the case. Are, are they uh, saved through the process of the of bringing about the Messiah? Well, sure. Eve, thus also through the lineage of the Messiah, coming down to Mary through Israel, even somewhat symbolically or typologically through Israel as a she, brings about the Messiah. And she is saved through the Messiah, through that childbearing, if she continues in this life of holiness that is a life of discipleship in Jesus. So if Paul is making an argument from creation, the argument is not this, that Eve and particularly that women in the the life of the church are of any lesser value or even more likely to be deceived. He's making an argument using this first word that Adam is the one or was the one who was held responsible. And perhaps then is also saying, and those who are the ones responsible for the healthy teaching and authority in the life of the church, like Adam, they will be the ones who are held accountable for this foundation as they teach even those, like Paul has already said, who are willing to, are able to be disciples, both male and female, in the life of the church. They are responsible for those disciples and making sure that they are growing in a healthy and united way in the life of the community.
We're going to pick up more in chapter three and discuss this concept again as we look there. But let me just kind of give you a little bit of a preview. What we discover in chapter three is this. Paul says, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of an overseer, he desires a a noble task, a good work. We want to unpack that verse in our next section. But notice this, the the overseer must be above reproach. So if, if we are going to argue that this role of teaching and authority together is uniquely responsible for, or uniquely tasked with this responsibility of teaching what's healthy, then the the reality is, is that they must be above reproach. They must be like Jesus. They can't just be anyone. They're given this task. But notice that they must be, verse 2, able to teach. So what do we have? We have overseer language added to teach language. Remember what Paul said? I do not allow them to teach nor have authority. I think Paul's only prohibition or the limited prohibition of what we see in chapter two is actually for this particular role. And what I've tried to do in somewhat of a summary of just two brief sessions is take the literature and the conversations and try to sit down with you and say, boy, there's a lot going on here, but try to summarize it as best as I can into a way that I think we can be consistent with. Because in the life of the church, one thing's one thing that I've observed just in, in my own leadership and my own life is it's it's difficult to be consistent with some of the complementarian views. It's also difficult to be consistent with what we find at times, in my opinion, in Scripture with some of the egalitarian views. But it's this nuanced complementarian view that I kind of look at and go, boy, this seems to be consistent with the New Testament as well as the early church and our ability to live it out. But let me kind of, again, maybe summarize a few things. Um, I think when it comes to even not just the New Testament, what do we observe, what do we not observe? Here's what we don't observe. We actually don't observe anyone other than males fulfilling the role of the elder overseer role in the New Testament. We see them fulfilling other roles that we could describe as being a teaching-like role. And we can even argue that we see other roles that have authority inherent to them. And yet when it comes to the teaching authority in the New Testament, as well as in the early church, we just don't observe that. Um, I also think then we can be rather consistent with this in the life of the church today. So again, that's my opinion coming to a very, very difficult text, the conclusions that I've drawn from that. But when it comes to canonical context, historical context, as well as the immediate literary context, I think that conclusion of a nuanced complementarian view is, in my opinion, the one that we can come away with and apply most consistently, and perhaps even according to how God has created the healthy household to work. Now, last thing. One day I was walking, reflecting on, on teaching this, because I realized it's, it's controversial. And, and I sort of asked the question, are we at times more content to attack the hierarchy that God has placed us in, rather than attacking the sin that has infested and affected the hierarchy? We can take it even broader than this and take it to kind of the, the greater world that we live in, in kind of the political or civil life that we live in. Are we more content to attack the hierarchy and just be against government and against those who are over us rather than being against the sin that impacts that government or the sin that impacts those in authority over us? Well, the same thing would be true in the life of the church and then even in the life of our immediate household. I have to admit, we live in a context, oftentimes a worldview, culture that is against all hierarchy. And rather than being against the sin that erodes away at the hierarchy, we just try to tear down the hierarchy, any hierarchies. We don't want to submit to anything. And the opposite reproach to that may be what we find and we're going to discover in chapter three is a healthy household, a healthy leadership of those who are sacrificial rather than being self-serving, who don't use power for their own good, but use power for the sake of the body. The only way, I need to conclude this way, because I recognize some of you will want to even reach out and further this conversation, I would invite you to do so. But the only way that this is going to work is if we have a Christ-like attitude. It's Michelle Lee Barnwell in her book, Neither Egalitarian Nor Complementarian, who argues um, for this dynamic that says, maybe we need to rehang this on a biblical worldview. And it's also then Cynthia Westfall who says that, you know, when it comes to Christ being the head of the church, interesting thing about this particular image is that in the ancient world, when it comes to the headship of the emperor or someone else who is the head of a house, oftentimes the the head would want the body to sacrifice itself for the sake of the head existing. Because after all, if the head's cut off, the body dies. 
But what's interesting in the New Testament is that as Christ comes along, the head actually sacrifices itself for the body. It's upside down. It's a reversal of all things. And this actually needs to be true in our view of church leadership, is that church leadership is not so much a power over, but a responsibility for. And so the headship of Christ actually is the example that we live by, that those who are called into this responsibility carry a burden to serve and to disciple. You see, sometimes we've, like Michelle Lee Barnwell articulated, we've actually hung this whole conversation on a debate that's being held in the greater world, rather than perhaps coming back to the New Testament and saying, maybe there's just like a new way to be human, a new way to live in community together. That's what we want to try to tap into as we now start to unpack even further conversations in chapter three and chapter four. 